Uh, so good morning. My name is Dr. Megan Edwards, and today I've been invited here by uh, APC Proteins to um, talk to you about piglet quality and why we should um, focus on piglet qu quality as a driver of profit for the overall swine operation. So two uh, key parameters that we can use to measure our success in terms of productivity are the kilograms of pork meat that we produce in a sow lifetime and the cost to produce each kilogram of pork meat. Now, today I don't have um, the time to talk in great detail about all the aspects that influence these two traits, um, but today's presentation will focus primarily on the breeding sow um, with the objective of improving piglet quality and then also um, on the suckling phase and nursery phase as well, with the objective of investing early um, for a maximum um, opportunity to capitalise on the investment long term. So the three pillars um, around sow nutrition that um, I'm looking at today are sow productivity, uh, piglet quality and colostrum quality, and how we can use nutrition to influence these pillars um, to drive profit. So it's really important um, before we get started to take a moment to reflect on uh, the challenges that uh, the breeding sow will go through in her reproductive cycle. Um, and these are normal commercial challenges. Um, this is not a welfare issue, but the reality is that sows do experience um, lots of uh, physiological challenges. They have oxidative stress, they have inflammation, they have microflora disruption, and they're all very normal parts of um, commercial pig production, but it's also um, acceptable to uh, acknowledge that we should have nutritional tools to intervene um, to, to support the sow with these everyday challenges that she's going through. So beginning um, at the time of weaning, the sow will have to go through um, mammary involution, um, and this involves inflammation. Um, it can be a little bit stressful for the sow, um, and it's after mating, she'll also go through another disruptive phase because we change the diet and heavily restrict her feed intake. Um, and this will, of course, uh, cause shifts in the microflora. Um, and again, it's a minor stress, but it, it still is a stress. And then as we move through the gestation phase, we know that um, once we hit the middle of the gestation, we have uh, rapid growth of the mammary tissue as well as rapid growth of the litter. And when we have rapid growth, we have oxidative stress. Um, these two things are aligned. And when we have increased oxidative stress, we also have increased um, need for antioxidants. And this uh, diagram here is looking at glutathione peroxidase, which is the antioxidant associated with selenium. And over here, um, it's a very similar graph, but this one is for um, alpha tocopherol or vitamin E. And both graphs show the same pattern, that as we approach um, farrowing, we have an increase in oxidative stress and it takes the sow roughly three weeks to recover from that stress. After farrowing, we also have stress of um, uterine involution um, and ma rapid mammary growth, et cetera, um, as well as um, metabolic stress associated with very high output of milk. And at the same time, as the sow has to deal with the stresses that come with uh, this high performance, she also has to decide how much she's got left to invest in her next litter. And um, this is something that uh, deserves more attention in our industry. Um, and we need to think very carefully about um, how the nutrition we uh, use today uh, influences her performance tomorrow. So the sow has to decide in early lactation how many follicles she's going to release, and this will determine the litter size for the next litter. So I'm just going to give a few examples in the next few slides about um, productivity. This particular example here is looking at the influence that total dietary fibre can have on productivity. Um, and this was a, a study done where they used very uh, purified sources of fibre, uh, but what you can see here is that relative to control sows that had an average daily intake of 350 grams of TDF um, versus sows that had six or 700 grams of TDF per day, there was a significant increase in the number of follicles, um, which means that the potential for increase in litter size is significantly enhanced. 
So we often think as of fibre as a, a non-nutrient, but this data here very clearly shows that it has a very important role to play in reproduction. Um, and it is something that we should pay more attention to in the future. So this is one strategy to get more piglets. The other strategy that is equally important is to make sure that we keep the sows in our herds as long as possible. Um, so this data here that I'm sharing with you is looking at sow retention. Um, so premature culling is a large um, economic burden on producers. So looking at strategies to reduce premature culling and trying to get sows through to parity six or seven um, should be a clear objective. So in this study, uh, in those sows that were offered a low dose of plasma, so only two and a half kilos per tonne, we still see a very nice um, reduction in the body weight loss of the sows during lactation. Um, in addition to that, we see a nice response in terms of the wean to estrus. So um, the data is expressed here uh, showing only the data for young sows. And you can see here for young sows, there is a two-day reduction in the wean to estrus. Over the entire herd, it was uh, less obvious. But in another study where they used a, a slightly higher rate of plasma of five kilos per tonne, we can see a very nice reduction again in wean to estrus. And in the same study, they found a significant increase in subsequent litter size. So this is um, showing that plasma can have a particularly valuable um, response in parity one um, sows and probably parity one and two sows who are very sensitive to uh, commercial pressures. And in addition to this, the data over here is looking at sow retention. So in the control group, 80% of sows were retained and 20% were culled. But when we offered plasma, we had 87% retention and only 13% culling. And it was a, a tendency, but um, from an economic perspective, this is very significant to have a 7% reduction in uh, the number of sows that need to be culled, and particularly if it's uh, young sows, um, because we haven't yet made a profit um, until we reach parity three. Um, and it's also really important to acknowledge that um, we, we can't afford to only consider the performance of a sow in this current uh, cycle. We need to think about the influence that this cycle has on the next because we know that how she performs in parity one and two will influence how she performs for her lifetime. And this is data done um, where they offered plasma only for six days before farrowing and five days after farrowing, so for a very short window but it is a window where we have a lot of oxidative stress and inflammation. Um, and this data here is looking at the subsequent litter size. So we gave plasma to these sows during a particular farrowing process and in the subsequent litter, so here we're influencing the number of follicles the sow decides to release, we can see a very um, significant and positive influence on the total born and the born alive of the subsequent litter. And if um, this is the data for the whole herd, and here is the data for uh, parity one sows, but you can see here that it seems to uh, have a very positive effect across all parities, um, including parity one. And again, if we can get parity one sows off to a better start, um, this means that they are very likely to perform um, at a higher level in parity two and throughout their productive life. So traditionally, we know about plasma protein because it um, uh, is used widely in nursery feeds and has been uh, successfully used for probably 40 years. But there is increasing evidence and um, APC has done a very good job of researching um, the benefits that we can get um, from using plasma in sows. And this is a, a summary that shows recent publications. But as you can see here, that at very low doses, plasma is able to improve productivity piglet quality, um, and these are key drivers of profit. So there's very good reason to consider low doses of plasma for use in sows and particularly in, in young sows. So if we now move on to the transition phase, it's one of the best opportunities we have to have a positive influence on productivity. Um, and when I think about the nutrition, the transition phase, um, there are three key areas. So first is still birth rate. We need to make sure that we get um, pigs born alive. In addition to that, we need to make sure we have uh, good birth weights and um, minimise variation. 
And then once the pigs are on the ground, we need to make sure that we're able to supply them with the best quality colostrum. And there are um, lots of nutrients listed here that have been proven um, through publication to improve uh, stillbirth rate or birth weight or colostrum quality. Um, so we do have a lot of nutritional tools available to us. Um, and there's something that I think deserves more time and effort um, from us in a commercial sense. We do a lot of great research, but as an industry, um, we need to work harder to, to apply these so we can get maximum profit. So just, I again, haven't got time to go through them all, but I'm going to give you a few examples. This is one that's looking at fibre um, in relation to stillbirth rate. This was done in a Danish study, a Danish herd, um, so you have very high litter size. And they had a control group that was already receiving uh, quite a nice amount of fibre, so just under 500 grams a day of TDF. And then um, the treatment group um, had a step-up program where they received just under 600 grams um, in the two weeks before farrowing. And in the final week before farrowing, they received around 650. Um, and what it was able to do was to significantly reduce the stillbirth rate by 2.2% and had an overall um, positive effect um, on total mortality for those sows. And if you look at the distribution um, here, the, the proportion of sows that had one or less uh, stillborn piglets, which is a common target, was significantly greater for those sows that received the, the fibre supplement. So making sure that sows have adequate fibre um, is important for lots of reasons. Um, but particularly during the transition phase to have a positive impact on both the, the sow and, and piglet performance. Um, this is a similar study. Uh, uh, this one was done um, in France and it's uh, using very high fibre again in the last few weeks prior to farrowing. They found no um, influence on the volume of colostrum, but the uh, farrowing process was much faster. So the first 10 pigs were born much faster, which meant that those pigs were able to reach the teats and suckle colostrum much quicker. And the, the big um, advantage here was for the low birth weight piglets. So for the low birth weight piglets, the colostrum consumption went from 140 grams up to 220 grams um, when the sows were offered fiber in transition. And the um, time to first suckle was significantly reduced. So this increases the chance of survivability, which was clearly demonstrated here in the mortality data. So this slide here is looking at the importance of colostrum and the relationship between the, the level of IgG in the sow's colostrum and the level of IgG that is achieved in the piglet. And generally speaking, we're looking for a number that's greater than 4,700 um, to be considered good quality colostrum. And then what we can see here is the level of IgG that we find in piglets. Um, and here we're looking for a level um, over 1,500 to make sure that that piglet has a good chance to survive. And as you can see, there's a really nice positive linear relationship. So the better quality the sow's colostrum is, the better uh, IgG status the piglet will have. Uh, the yellow box here is showing you... Um, the piglets that are receiving adequate colostrum um, and have a high chance of survival. The blue box is showing you the piglets that are uh, at risk of um, premature death and the white box is the group in between. Um, so it's important that we do what we can to boost the, the quality of the um, colostrum and the sow will spend around three weeks uh, to prepare her colostrum and that's the three weeks before farrowing. And the welfare and the health of the sow at that time will influence what she does invest into her colostrum. And there is a lot of uh, research to show that we can use nutrition to manipulate the, the well, welfare and health of the sow and subsequently have a positive influence on colostrum. Um, so there's good data for medium chain fatty acids and live yeasts, for butyrates and yeast fractions. And then there's also some data for conjugated linoleic acid, and vitamin E, and uh, one publication for, for arginine. And in general, these compounds are um, immune modulatory or immune stimulatory um, and having yeah, benefits for both the sow and her litter. Uh, this is some data for arginine. 
Now, I um, will admit that there are publications where there's no response from arginine, but in this particular publication, they did see a positive response of arginine on piglet vitality. Um, and so we have a, a numerical reduction in stillbirths associated with an increase um, in oxygen saturation levels. And oxygen saturation level is a very good indicator of vitality. And then your colostrum IgG um, in the highest arginine treatment was significantly improved. We had a, a nice improvement in birth weights and a reduction in the small birth weight peaks associated with the supplementation of arginine. So arginine is a vasodilator and it's allowing a more even distribution of nutrients um, throughout the placenta um, and ensuring that um, piglet vitality is, is improved. Now, two more examples. On the left, um, we're looking at the influence of probiotics on colostrum quality. So you can see a significant improvement in the IgG and colostrum and also a significant improvement in the plasma of the piglets. Um, and that is a very well proven um, effect in, in the publications that by providing live yeast, we have this positive uh, response in, in colostrum quality. Over on the right, we're looking at um, the influence of vitamin E on colostrum quality. So we um, do see a nice response from vitamin E to colostrum fat, which is important for energy and survivability. And then uh, we also see a nice response in IgG and IgA. And uh, in this particular study, uh, they saw a nice improvement in weaning weight and average daily gain in the piglets getting the higher dose of vitamin E. But it is important, I point out, that the level of vitamin E used in the control diet was very low. Um, I think we need to focus more on colostrum because it not only has an influence on the survival of the piglets in the first three days after birth, but it has a subsequent influence on the whole of life performance of the animals. And the data here on the left um, showed that if the piglet received um, 200 grams roughly of colostrum, it would have a six kilo weaning weight. Whereas if we uh, were able to have an intake of 350 grams of colostrum, that pig was much more likely to have an eight kilogram weaning weight at the same age. So that's a, that's a two kilo difference in weaning weight based on 150 gram difference in colostrum intake. So very profound um, effect. Um, and then some similar data, slightly older, but it showed um, again that if the intake of the average intake of a piglet in a litter was only 170 grams, the total litter would only grain 40 grams in the first 24 hours after birth. So basically no growth. But if the um, colostrum intake was close to what we would describe as our normal commercial target of 250 grams, then we could expect the litter to gain 900 grams. But if we can get that higher amount of colostrum um, up to 300 grams a day, um, then we can expect the litter to grow at a rate of 1.4 kilos. So you can imagine um, this is having a profound uh, impact on subsequent performance because we're getting those piglets off to a really good start. So in addition, um, the, another set of data that supports the same concept. So this was a study that was done at manipulating, looking at manipulating the level of fatty acids and the level of carnitine in diets. And this was done to create different qualities of colostrum. So the lowest group had the lowest fat in IgG. And then as they manipulated the diets, they were able to enhance the level of fat and the level of um, IgG. And what we saw is that the pigs uh, responded uh, positively to the improvement in the colostrum quality. And this resulted in roughly an extra 900 grams of weaning weight. So there is very consistent evidence that if we can boost the quality of colostrum, and we know that we can do that through nutrition, then we can have a really nice positive effect on, on weaning weights. Now, it's good to have positive effect on weaning weights. And we do know that the colostrum, um, the sorry, the IgG status of the piglets at weaning um, does have an influence on their whole of life performance. Um, and this data here uh, does confirm it. So in the um, first table here, we're looking at uh, a study that was multifactorial. So they looked at the influence of parity for your birth mother versus the, the influence of parity for um, whom you suckled. And if you were lucky enough to be born to a multiparous sow and suckled to a multiparous sow, you had uh, the highest weaning weights. 
Um, and if you were unlucky and you were born to a guilt and suckled to a guilt, you had the lowest. And then if we look at the uh, serum IgG levels at day 28, you can see here that those piglets that were suckled to guilt had the lowest IgG levels and those piglets that were suckled to sows had the higher IgG levels. And then if we look at the whole of life performance, um, you can see here that um, the best performance are piglets that were born and raised by multipara sows and the worst performance here are, are those that are born and raised by gilts. Um, and this is connected in part to the serum IgG levels. And uh, this second study um, was looking at using uh, conjugated linoleic acid to manipulate colostrum quality. And they uh, had two different doses of the conjugated linoleic acid and um, either dose gave a positive response in colostrum IgG, which improved the serum IgG of piglets and was converted into higher weaning weights. And then in addition to that, they followed the pigs for the next um, two weeks after weaning and they found that there was also um, a growth performance advantage um, in the two weeks after weaning. Um, and again, that this aligns with this higher IgG, but also the, the higher weaning weights. So if we go back a step and we look at um, what is um, plasma doing during lactation to support the sows and why do we see better growth performance and uh, reproductive performance from sows when they're fed plasma. Um, this is data from the study that I showed you earlier where they offered plasma just for a few days before and a few days after uh, farrowing. Um, and they looked at the oxidative um, status of those sows. So this is glutathione peroxidase. So again, it's the antioxidant associated with selenium. Um, and it's the first line of defense in the body um, against oxidative stress. And as we go from having no plasma in the diet up to five kilos or to 25 kilos, we see a nice improvement in the oxidative status of the sows. And this is prior to farrowing and this is after farrowing. So um, the benefits of the plasma are maintained both before and after farrowing. Um, and this helps us to understand if the sow is in a better state and she has less oxidative st stress, this means she should be able to partition more nutrients and um, immunity into her piglets. Um, and this is a study that looked at using plasma for a slightly longer period. So in this study, they used it for three weeks um, before farrowing and through lactation. And what they found in this particular study was when they offered plasma, they were able to reduce the body weight loss. They were able to uh, improve weaning weights and um, nursery exit weights. So here we have an extra half a kilo of weaning, which was converted into almost three kilos by the nursery exit. And this was um, partly achieved by a really nice improvement in feed conversion efficiency. It wasn't significant, but um, 10 FCR points for a commercial producer is of importance. In the particular study, they looked at the um, inflammatory markers and the stress markers within the sows and the piglets to see if the sow was able to pass on the benefits. And what we see here is that there was a reduction in inflammatory uh, marker TNF-alpha, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And we can see here that plasma is able to reduce um, the expression of this inflammatory marker at day three and day seven of lactation. And that in the piglets, it's also reduced um, at day seven of lactation. And then they looked at the stress marker cortisol. And what they found is that at day seven of lactation, the piglets had lower cortisol. And at day three post weaning, the piglets also had lower cortisol. So from offering plasma to the sows, they could reduce the stress in the piglets both during suckling and in the nursery phase. Um, so having a really nice positive welfare benefit. And this particular study was done using 1% plasma. There was no effect in the study. They did look at where the plasma could influence the quality of IgG in the colostrum, but this particular study did not find any uh, effect of plasma on IgG. So moving on to the nursery. Um, in the nursery, um, the three pillars that I'm focusing on are immunity and resilience, digestive development and growth performance. So we need, the, um, we need to provide the piglet with passive immunity 
um, whilst it's immature, we need to support the digestive development of that pig, um, particularly from four to seven weeks of age. And if we do those both well, um, we should be rewarded with enhanced growth performance. So there are um, some really good review papers, and this is um, one that I would encourage you to find the time to read. Um, it was recently published. And this particular paper is looking for alternatives to zinc oxide, which is a very hot topic in Europe, um, who's facing a ban on zinc from 1st of July. Um, but what it, you can see here from the list of viable alternatives, it has some that are nutritional strategies, so like lowering protein or in, increasing fiber. It has uh, typical eubiotics, and then it has these functional proteins. And you can see that plasma is um, included here as a, a viable alternative. And um, these three, uh, antimicrobial peptides, egg yolk antibodies, and plasma protein, are um, good uh, candidates as an alternative because they offer immune modulation, they offer pathogen control, and they also offer in, uh, enhanced nutrient utilization. So when we're talking about zinc, um, we're looking at uh, reducing inflammation, stopping diarrhea, et cetera, and um, limiting the opportunities of E. coli. So basically microflora modulation um, and there are lots of ways that we can do it. And I don't suggest that you pick just one of these. I think you use you, you need to use a combination of these to give the, the pig the best start. Um, but as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, immunity and resilience, they have to come from a form of passive immune protection. And not all of these alternatives can provide um, passive immune protection. Um, but plasma definitely can. So when we um, focus on, on diarrhea prevention in the nursery, um, we are very quick to add additives into the diet. But um, if we take a step back and we look at why are we adding zinc or why are we adding antibodies in the first place, it's because the diet that we're providing the pigs with isn't being utilised efficiently. So we are probably equally to blame. Um, and the reality is that when we add zinc or antibiotics, we're often covering up some of our mistakes. And um, we need to take a, a step back and review where it is that things might be going wrong. So we often um, see the diarrhea and our first reaction is to go back and, and change the diet. But um, we need to have a look at is that problem arising because there is a problem within the microbiome and how do we want to fix that or is the problem one step earlier and it's related to um, poor stomach function or is it just that we have a really terrible quality diet and we need to go back and really review the way we designed our diet. Now I do admit that nutrition is only one uh, parameter in the um, causation of diarrhea but um, it is one that I think we need to review more carefully and um, be more honest in our approach when we're looking for solutions that don't involve antibiotics or zinc. Um, and yeah, plasma has a, a really positive role to play in uh, diarrhea prevention. So this is a bit of a complicated slide, but it's um, a slide that I hope will um, demonstrate some of the, um, the cycles that we see in the body. So um, over here, when we wean the pig, uh, the normal event is that we get a drop in feed intake and that's often associated with stress. And because of that, we see this increase in um, intestinal inflammation. We then have this, in response to intestinal inflammation, there's a cascade and it causes an increase in oxidative stress. With this increase in oxidative stress, we get this um, increased production of nitrous oxide, which is then converted to nitrate. This nitrate then provides a wonderful food source for pathogens. These pathogens overgrow and cause a suppression of the good guys, which leads to inflammation and the cycle continues. Now, there can be other ways that the cycle can start. Um, so, for example, if the nursery was um, not cleaned very well and there was um, bacterial contamination, we could start with an overgrowth of bacteria leading to a suppression of um, good bacteria leading to inflammation and so on and so forth. However, if we take a, um, a step back and we look at, okay, what tools do we have and how are we going to do it? So first of all, we know that weaning is stressful and it's not always easy to fully avoid that stress. So we do know that 
feed intake suppression is a real risk. But we do have some tools. So we could um, use plasma to boost feed intake and reduce inflammation, or we could use zinc oxide to reduce uh, inflammation as well. If we're still worried about the risk of uh, antioxidant um, or oxidative stress, we could look at using antioxidants um, to support the pig. So this might include things like vitamin E and C, or it might include um, different types of polyphenols. And these are providing a immune modulatory benefit. And then um, we could look at using eubiotics as a way to manipulate the microbiome and to, for example, target gram-negative bacteria, or in the case of medium chain fatty acids, target gram-positive bacteria, um, as a way to reduce the bacterial load and manipulate balance within the microbiome. If we're still concerned, we could look at using pre and postbiotics to give the beneficial bacteria a competitive edge. Um, and lastly, we could go back one step further and, and do a, um, a review of the, the management and the approach that we use um, prior to weaning. So um, creep feeding is really important, and I'm going to highlight a little bit more about why that is shortly. Um, weaning age can also be something that um, you can adapt. So uh, by delaying the weaning age, we can give the pigs a better chance to cope with stress associated with weaning. Um, we can look at providing extra glutamine to the pigs as a source of um, fuel for the small intestine. Or we can look at technologies like fetal imprinting, where we um, uh, provide a particular additive to lactating sows. Um, and then we use the same additive in the piglet diets. And that familiar, familiar taste and smell encourages greater feed intake. So we have a lot of options available to us. And I'm not saying that you need to use them all but I would encourage you to review what you're doing and why you're doing it and see whether um, you're actually meeting the, the needs of your pigs. So another very excellent publication that I came across a few days ago that is also worth a read. Um, this is a meta-analysis that was looking at um, alternatives for antibiotics. Now, not all uh, eubiotics are included in the meta-analysis. So um, please take this um, with a pinch of salt. But this particular group of authors um, concluded that for weaned pigs, probably the best um, option that we will have in, in the short term is with antimicrobial peptides. They present um, evidence for having a very consistent and profound effect in weaned pigs. Um, but the other thing to point out here is that there are lots of options for piglets that do appear to have some positive effect um, in terms of growth promotion and disease prevention. The other interesting thing about this publication is that it suggests that um, the options for older pigs are quite different and um, they propose that plant extracts or plants in general um, present a really good opportunity for grower and finisher pigs. So I'd just like to go back um, one step to talk a little bit about stomach pH and organic acids and this is something that I've been looking into lately to try to understand um, why we should use acids and how to convince people that they're important. And when I looked into the literature, what I found is that the pH of colostrum is actually only five or six. It's quite high. And that's intentional because um, the pH needs to be high so that the gut can be colonized, um, which is a really important process in the first few days of life. Um, and the reason that the pH is high is so it can let in a broad spectrum of, of, of uh, microbes. But there's also really good passive immunity within the colostrum to filter um, who's able to get in and, and remain inside the pig. Then we go on to um, day two and beyond where we are now producing milk and the pH will go from five or six down to four. And it goes down to four because that's where mother nature needs it to be because the pH of four is the best pH for um, clotting milk and to allow the milk to be uh, fully digested. Um, and so to, to clot milk, we need an enzyme called chymosin, and chymosin is most successfully clotted at a pH of four. So it makes sense that um, the pH of the stomach during um, this few weeks uh, sits at around four. But the unfortunate part about that is that at a pH of four, there is no um, development of the cells required for the secretion of hydrochloric acid. 
Um, so that means that the pig's ability to lower stomach pH isn't developing um, in response to, to the milk. However, there is good evidence that I'm going to show you in a moment that by providing creep feed, we can stimulate the development of these um, uh, cells that are responsible for secreting hydrochloric acid and ultimately for digesting protein. So the phase that causes us the most problems is the immediate post-weaning period, and that's because we are ultimately trying to get the pH down to 2.5, but we've now taken away lactose, so the substrate that we had to hold the pH at around 4 is gone. We've now introduced cereal-based diets. Um, they have a range of acid-binding capacities. Um, if we have a low weaning age, it's even more difficult to keep the pH low. Often we have um, variable and inconsistent feed intake, which also um, makes it difficult to regulate how the stomach works. Um, and this all has a, an effect on protein, digest protein digestibility um, and risk of post-winning diarrhea, et cetera. So we really need to add uh, free organic acids into the piglet feeds to be able to drop the stomach pH um, down as low as possible. And ideally to get the protein digestion to work efficiently as possible, the pH has to be very close to 2.5 because at a pH of four, um, we're going to have poor protein digestion. Um, and this is why, so basically it's a bit of a slippery slide journey and we're trying to get down to the bottom as quickly as possible. Um, and that's why we need to use acids. I think um, for many of us, we assume that the pH is actually low during the suckling phase and then it goes up and we need to bring it back down. But in fact, it's high in colostrum, it's medium in the milk phase, and then we need to push it down in this post-weaning period. And that's also why we need to probably have a step-down approach with the organic acids that we use. To a phase, what you find is that Pigs are very capable of excreting adequate amount of hydrochloric acid and they're really good at maintaining a low pH. So if you were to use organic acids in this phase, it would be because you would like to have a, an influence on uh, the microbiome. So uh, this data here is looking at the influence that creep feed has on the development of these hydrochloric acid secreting cells. Um, and first of all, so there's two treatments, one that was only offered milk from the sow they were weaned at 30 days. And this group here is offered um, creep feed. And you can see by, for the group that were offered pre-feed, by the end of the suckling phase, they had larger stomach capacity. Um, and this is good. Um, a, it means they could, in theory, have a higher appetite. And B, it means that the, um, the feed that's in the stomach has a greater surface area and can be exposed to more digestive enzymes. And then here we're looking at the acid production, so how much hydrochloric acid is being produced. And you can see that it's relatively low um, for the full 30 days in the control treatment, but it increases um, particularly by day 30 in the group that received creep feed. So they had a 60% increase in their ability to excrete hydrochloric acid. And as you can imagine, this means that they have a much better capability to lower stomach pH. And then in relation to, to protein digestion, we're looking at pepsin output here. So we, um, we take the pepsinogen, convert it to pepsin to digest protein. And uh, here you can see that the pepsin output um, remains relatively low in the control. But in the animals that were offered creep feed, there is a huge increase in the pepsin output. So the chance for these pigs to digest the soybean meal in the creep feeds is much, much greater than it is for these pigs over here. And therefore the risk of diarrhea is much lower. So there are also management strategies that we can consider. Um, I'm about to talk about co-mingling. So I'm just showing you this photo of what is co-mingling. Co-mingling is um, a situation where the, you have multiple firing crates and they have a little door so the piglets can um, mingle. Normally from about day seven of lactation, they can uh, go and visit their neighbours and uh, expand their horizons. So in this study, they had the group that was conventionally raised, they had those that were intermittent suckled. So that's where the sow is removed from the litter for a number of hours during the day. Um, and that's to encourage feed intake. And then we have this group that is intermittent suckled as well as co-mingled. You can see that there was no difference in the weaning weights of the pigs, but there was a difference in the creep feed intake. So the highest feed intake was um, in those that were intermittent suckled and co-mingled. 
And then here we have the data for after weaning. And you can see that there was a really nice improvement um, in the first week after weaning, so an extra 600 grams of growth. Those um, animals that are, were exposed to intermittent suckling and commingling. The difference here is they're being commingled with their friends that they've known before uh, weaning. And here we've got piglets that are uh, intermingled with animals, new pigs, so non-familiar pigs. So there's a, probably a little bit of additional stress for these kinds. And what we see in terms of feed intake is that there's a really nice increase. Um, so we're looking at, in this particular group, it's the 100 grams per day of extra feed intake in the first week after weaning. Um, and that is an indicator that the, the pigs are, are happy and healthy um, if they have high appetites. And then because of that, we get very nice growth rates. So management is also a really important tool that we should review um, when we're looking at strategies to, to boost piglet quality. So uh, just a quick review on plasma. Um, it's been in the market for a long time. So 10 years ago, roughly, uh, a meta-analysis was done and these were the results. So we're getting roughly uh, 40 grams of extra average daily gain and 45 grams of average daily feed intake. Um, so it's on average about a 20% improvement um, for those pigs, with the response being slightly higher in those earlier weaned pigs. Now, there was a very recent meta-analysis done, which would include obviously more data. It would include um, more examples of trials that were done perhaps without zinc or without antibiotics um, and using more hyperprolific animals. And But you see the, the numbers aren't that different. We're still getting roughly um, 40 grams of extra average daily gain and um, a slightly higher amount of average daily feed intake. Um, but still, uh, the, it's still roughly a 20% magnitude of response. So it is very, very, very good. Um, and yeah, the evidence to support the use of plasma in nursery just continues to grow. So using um, plasma, um, one of the great things about it is the farmers can see it. They, um, it's visually obvious that the pigs are eating well and happier. Um, so that's one of the great things about the product. But underneath all that, we need to know what, what the product is doing. And this um, trial was done um, and they used 3% plasma for two weeks followed by 2% plasma for another two weeks. And they found a, roughly a half a kilo advantage um, to the exit weights. They also found a nice uh, 20 cent reduction in the medication uh, cost. And what we see here uh, is the uh, tight junctions um, expression in the intestinal tract in the ileum was uh, increased by the use of plasma. So that means that the animal is more resilient and um, able to fend off disease and remain healthier. And when they looked at the villus height, um, the study was done as a two by two factorial. So they had um, the use of plasma with and without antibiotics. And so you can see here that in animals without antibiotics, the magnitude of the response is even greater. Um, but still, when you have antibiotics in play, there's still a positive benefit from using plasma um, in terms of improving the architecture of the gut. And obviously, if we have a higher villi, we can have better FCR. Um, some more data that um, looked at the positive responses we see in plasma. So here again, we have our tight junction proteins, and we also have some other markers. So TLR2, so toll-like receptor 2, is a, a marker of um, pathogen recognition. So obviously being able to, having a higher expression of this pathogen recognition um, marker means that we have greater protection against bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi. Um, and then there was a, another marker that's associated with the, the, um, a healing process within the body. Again, it was upregulated in the pigs receiving plasma. They also looked at permeability in this study and um, DAO is dianamine oxidase and um, it's a compound that leaks out of uh, villi into the bloodstream. So um, if you have a lower number, uh, it's a good thing. And it means that you have healthier um, villi and uh, less physical damage on the villi structure itself. Um, so this is a marker of permeability, which would suggest that the um, intestinal integrity of the uh, pigs offered plasma 
is, is higher. And again, they looked at inflammation and they saw a significant reduction in TNF-alpha and a uh, strong tendency for interferon gamma. So they're both pro-inflammatory cytokines. So plasma seems to enhance gut functionality and reduce inflammation. And as I showed earlier in the cells, it's also having a positive influence on the oxidative status. In conclusion, um, I think as an industry, we're under increasing pressure with high feed prices, with disease pressure. Um, and competition against other industries. So we're going to have to continue to keep our focus very heavily on productivity and efficiency. Um, but, yeah, the good news is that nutrition can have a really positive influence, um, but it's not going to have an influence on its own. It will have to be um, examined um, alongside management, health and genetics so that we can have the best possible outcomes. But I hope today's presentation has... Um, got you thinking about investing early because I strongly believe that the ROI is better um, if we get the job done early. So investing in our sows so they can give more to their piglets and then getting those piglets off to an excellent start um, is, is the plan that I think makes the most sense. And things like colostrum quality do deserve um, a lot more attention. Plasma protein is a really functional nutrient um, that has been around for a long time, but we need, we, we're constantly learning about its value and um, it should be used to complement and boost other nutritional strategies that we want to apply. Um, there, of course, it's been used widely in nursery, but I hope today I've shown you that there's very good evidence to support its use in uh, sows for their health, welfare and productivity. Um, and the other thing that I think we need to um, do more of is to sit back and reflect on the challenges that the animals we're working with are going through. And they're not necessarily unavoidable challenges. A lot of the oxidative stress or inflammation is just a normal part of life. But we can have a, a positive influence on the incidence and severity by using uh, nutrition to our advantage. Um, so I hope when you uh, review the value of um, things like plasma, you'll think about what value it could bring to your animals in terms of reducing oxidative stress and inflammation and also um, how it's going to enhance gut health and functionality because ultimately these are drivers of profitability and piglet quality. Thank you very much for your time.